يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم القصاص في القتل الحر بالحر والعبد بالعبد والأنثى بالأنثى فمن عفي له من أخيه شيء فاتباع بالمعروف وأداء إليه بإحسان ذلك تخفيف من ربكم ورحمة فمن اعتدى بعد ذلك فله عذاب أليم ولكم في القصاص حياة يا أولي الألباب لعلكم تتقون رب الشح لصدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد وانسى جانا بي والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today uh, some commentary on two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah Ayahs number 178 and 179 These are ayat that follow right after one of the longer ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah Ayat Al-Bir which is a comprehensive view of goodness in the Quran Allah Azza wa Jal in the early part, or the, uh, this is the second half of Surah Al-Baqarah, and in the early part of it, Allah Azza wa Jal gave us a set of ahkam, set of rulings that, that govern the basics of Muslim society. And this is actually a really interesting placement in Surah Al-Baqarah, because if you look on the exact opposite side, on the first half of Surah Al-Baqarah, you'll find the laws that were given to Banu Israel, and how they messed them up. So on the one hand, you have the Israelites and what they messed up, and on the other hand, it's the new people, the, the new ummah, the Muslims, and the laws that they're given, they better not mess them up. Right? So we're being given the second chance. They lost their opportunity, now it's our turn to prove ourselves. That's how the, the, the surah is kind of structured, or at least some hints into the structure of this remarkable surah. Anyhow, the, the laws that we're going to talk about today, that were mandated in this uh, Medinan life, are actually called the laws of Qisas. Qisas is commonly translated as retribution or blood money. You may have heard the word blood money before. Okay? And what the idea is, you know, the, the biblical term is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know? So if, for example, if you kill, you should be killed. You know? And if you kill two, or you know, if, if, if you took an eye, then your eye should be taken. If you cut a hand, your hand should be cut, etc. So this is equal retribution. Right? So this is the Qur'an's version of that that's completing and perfecting what was given in the people before. You should know some background. The Arabs were a very uh, angry people. So when they get into a fight, they really get into a fight. So if you kill somebody's sheep, they might kill your whole village. And, that, that, and for three generations, they might just keep coming after you because you killed their sheep or something. They get pretty serious. Okay? So they didn't just stop at one point and they just kept the revenge kept going and the anger kept going. Right? And that kind of thug mentality still exists. Yo, you touch one of my people, I'm going to take you all out or something. You know, they had this attitude that we're going to take revenge and all the, there's no end to our rage. As a matter of fact, even in unjustified war, you might have cases where there's one nation attacking the other or there's some political incident out at sea or some, some incident of, you know, a crime against an embassy or something like that and a few people are killed and as a result, in response, thousands of people are murdered with carpet bombs or some other crazy thing, you know. So this is actually the lopsided kind of justice that exists today where one life is not worth another life. Right? And of course, in, in, in modern language, uh, uh, you know, as we live in the, in the United States of America where an, a, a life is actually, the worth of a life is very relative. And the morality that is associated with the worth of a life is so, it's incredible how hypocritical it is. So for example, if an American is killed somewhere in you know, the Middle East, if an American kill, is killed in the Muslim world somewhere, there's an uproar. But if an American is killed in downtown Baltimore, uh, nobody knows about it or cares. Because they come from a minority community, low income neighborhood. They, people get shot there all the time, no big deal. You know? So you have this, whatever can be sensationalized. And as a result, by the way, if one of ours was killed, we'll take a hundred of theirs. Or we'll do, you know, all of that. But even actually within, within the United States, there's this hypocrisy of what life matters and what life doesn't matter. And it's not just an American governmental hypocrisy. People just generally were so duped into what were fed all the time by media, what, what life matters and what life doesn't matter. Right? And the, the value of human life is just trivialized. And of course, when you see murder on, the, on TV all the time, not only in entertainment, but even in the news, this many people killed, that many people killed, they just become numbers. They don't really mean anything. Like you can't process what that could mean. You know? So now in, that, in, in the Arab context, this, the value of human life, 
Yeah, when it came to revenge, your honor was far more important than human life. You could kill out of rage and out of protecting the dignity of your tribe, etc. And these feuds could go on for ages and ages. And Allah is now going to change that cultural mindset. So before we get into this ayah, I want to talk a little bit, very quickly, about what it takes to change a culture. Culture is not easily changed. When people have a certain mentality, certain emotions that they are raised with, certain things that make them angry, that have always made them angry, that used to make their parents angry and their grandparents angry, and they were raised with the same anger, you can't just get it out of their system. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen that way. It takes a long time before you can make a change in a person's culture, in an entire society's culture. As a matter of fact, when people became Muslim, even the, as, as people became Muslim and completely submitted themselves to Allah, they were willing to die for the sake of Allah on the battlefield. Even then, Allah did not see it fit that He should reveal laws about alcohol yet. Because even though they're shown commitment to Allah to give up their life, a cultural practice that's a part of their family tradition and everybody does it is drinking, they're not ready to quit that yet. It was given in stages. It wasn't given right away. Because some things you can't just give up right away. It takes time. And Allah Azza wa Jal in His wisdom knew that. Even for the best generation, He took His time. This is why you find, you think about the statement of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, لَوْ أَوَّلَ مَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنَ لَا تَشْرِبُ الْخَمْرِ لَقُلْنَا وَاللَّهِ لَنْ نَتْرُكَ الْخَمْرَ أَبَدًا If the first thing Qur'an said was don't drink alcohol, we would have said, Wallahi, we're never going to leave alcohol. What are you talking about? We weren't ready for that yet. A mindset has to be developed, right? So even for a person to make changes, it takes time. Can you imagine for a society? It takes a long time for a society to make changes, right? Now the other thing that's often not appreciated or not understood is that people say that, you know, the, the Meccan Qur'an, the Meccan Seerah was about building Iman. And then in Medina, we had the laws and the rules. And so the rule is, first you have to have Iman, and when your Iman is strong, then you can follow the rules. And this is an oversimplification that can be pretty dangerous. Let me tell you something that's going to reverse engineer this, this, this idea. The, the most difficult time to be Muslim was not Medina. The most difficult time to be Muslim was in Mecca. In Mecca there was no, there, for a long time there was no five daily prayer. There was no zakat. There was no laws of halal and haram meat. There was no laws of hijab. Actually they came in the 16th year, which means a few years after the Prophet moved to Medina. Right? There were no laws about alcohol. There was nothing about riba. There was nothing about swine. It was like, but why, how can you get in trouble for being Muslim? You don't do anything. Like if you saw a Sahabi from the second year, third year, then you wouldn't be able to tell what makes them Muslim. You wouldn't be able to tell. They don't do any things that we do. There's no five daily prayers yet. There's no fasting in Ramadan yet. There's nothing. So what makes them Muslim? As a matter of fact, the fact that they stood up for this belief in one God, the fact that they said, we're not going to let, we're not going to sit quiet if you kill baby girls alive, they stood up for injustice in society because of their Islam. They couldn't see intolerant, like injustice in society. That's what made them public enemy number one. As a matter of fact, compare their life to what they lived in Medina. Medina is way easier. It is much easier. But somebody says, no, 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 but the battles happened in Medina. Medina is a lot harder because we, we had to fight on the battlefield. We didn't have to fight on the battlefield in Mecca. I would argue, actually, that's not true either. Tell me something. If somebody is about to hit you, if somebody's about to hit you, what's a natural response? At least put your hand up. At least. And thereafter, an understandable response is you fight them back. So the first natural response is you defend yourself. At least put your hand up. And secondly, it's understandable that you'll fight back and retaliate. Because they're going to kill you. If, you, if. if you don't fight back, they might kill you. What happens in Mecca? What is the requirement from Allah? Alam tara ila ladina qila lahum kuffu aidiyakum. Did you look at those who were told, hold your hands back? So when you're taking a beating, what should you do? Don't even defend yourself. Don't even defend yourself. At least in, and by the way, when the fighting was allowed, in, and I'm using the word allowed on purpose, in Medina, udhina lil The word udhina was used by Allah. Finally, permission is given, you can fight back now. Now you compare. You are being beat up and you can't even fight back. You're not allowed to fight, but just have sabr. Your family is being ripped to shreds and you just, you're told, Ispiru, ala Yasir. Just be, have patience, family of Yasir. Just have patience. And on the other hand, you can finally fight those who kicked you out of your homes. You can finally fight those who've been fighting you. Which one is easier? 
Well, think about that. Subhanallah. You know, so Makkah is much harder. Makkah is much harder. And let's say, Makkah is the time where we just talked about, Allah just talked about Iman. And eventually the hard rules came in Medina. This is complete nonsense when you study the seerah. Makkah is a time where Iman was built after having made the toughest sacrifices. Iman didn't come cheap. Iman did not come cheap. And then when these regulations came, this was actually, Yuridullahu li yukhaffifa ankum. Allah wants to make things easier for you. Life in Medina is way easier than life in Makkah. That's why actually you don't have munafiqoon in Makkah. There's no advantage to becoming Muslim in Makkah. What are you going to join for? So you can join the beatdown too for yourself? But when you join the Muslims in Medina, then, alam nakum ma'akum. Can we also come up? Weren't we with you? You know? بَلْ تَحْسُدُونَنَا Hey, let us come with you. No, 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 you don't let us come with you. Are you jealous of us? The munafiqoon would also want to join the battle because they know something at the end will come their way. They'll get some worldly advantages too. Subhanallah. So it is an oversimplification of the seerah that we look at it in that way. Anyway, these ahkam have now come to a people that are firm in iman. They've been tried and tested. And now these regulations are given so they can pass them down generation after generation. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِصَاسِ Those of you who have iman, those of you who claim to believe, the, the law of qisas, qassa means to cut. The law of cutting evenly has been mandated on you. Qassa also means to follow in precise footsteps. In other words, what was done must be retributed exactly and precisely. Now Allah says, fil qatla, in the matter of those who are killed. Al qatla. Okay. Now, the word al maqtul in Arabic means the one who's killed. Al-Qatla is the larger word for any who gets killed. Al-Maqtul would be a specific person. Al-Qatla, generally speaking, across the board, any who get murdered. In other words, Allah is not making a distinction between Muslim and non-Muslim. Anybody who gets killed, there's going to be Qisas. All human life has been given a value. All human life. The, 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 the blood of a mushrik is not cheaper. It's also a child of Adam. The Christian is not cheaper blood. The Jew is not cheaper blood. It's also a child of Adam. You can't just take their life either. It didn't create this dichotomy of more valuable human life versus less valuable human life. This is the power of Quran. Then he says, Al-Hurru bil-Hurri, wal-Abdu bil-Abdi, wal-Untha bil-Untha. Now this part is very commonly misunderstood and it, there is some problematic commentary in our classical, some of the classical tafsir also. I'll explain to you from a linguistic perspective what are some of the most powerful arguments on this. But first let me translate. The free one for the free one and the slave for the slave. And the woman for the woman. Now when you translate it like that, there's a problem. Because when you translate it like that, imagine a situation, because back in the day, now we don't have slaves, alhamdulillah, but back in the day you have a guy and you have a slave and you have three classes of citizens are being described. A free man, slave and woman. Imagine a free man killed a slave. Free man killed a slave. But the ayah says a free man should only pay by what? Free man. So the, the one who was killed was a slave. So you can't kill a free man, that's a different category. So you should actually, the free man should get you a slave that you can kill in his place. Because free man for free man, and slave for slave. And woman for woman. So if a woman killed, then, or a woman got killed, then a woman should be killed. That's not what the ayah is saying. And how do we know the ayah is not saying that? Because of lam al-ta'rif. The word al, the Arabic prefix al, is used on both. If you said hurrun bi hurrin, abdun bi abdin, Untha bi untha, then it would be actually a slave for a slave. Like I translated it in English. A free man for a free man. A woman for a woman. An eye for an eye. An eye, not the eye. An eye for an eye. But it's not an, it's the. Now what that does is, it's actually referring to the same thing twice. The fr now let me translate in English parlance so it's easier to understand. The free man will have to pay by himself. In other words, if the free man has killed, then the only one who will stand trial and face the judgment will be who? Himself. He himself. Nobody else. The slave, if he is killed, you say, well, this is a very valuable slave. Why don't you take the cheaper slave, kill him instead? No, no, no. That slave will have to pay himself for what he did. In other words, nobody will stand trial in your place. Instead of the ayah referring to the murder victim, it's actually referring to the perpetrator. Al-hurru bil-hurri, wal-abdu bil-abdi, wal-untha bil-untha. And a woman, for a woman. For the woman will pay by herself. You cannot take, if an elite tribes woman has committed a crime, she's a wealthy woman, 
And you say, well, take some other woman from the tribe. Don't leave, leave her alone. She's from a wealthy status. No. Nope. This principle is not just, by the way, in the ayah it's about qisas. But from it we actually learn something much larger. It's much larger. Double standards in the law. Allah talks about double standards in the law exhaustively in the Qur'an. And there are a couple of ayat that are very comprehensive on the subject. This is not the time for them. But I'll give you the gist of it. You have in the criminal justice system in the United States, other Western nations, other nations around the world, somebody steals. Let's say they steal from a grocery store. Right? They just stole some Kit Kat or something. And now they're standing in front of a judge. And the lawyer says, well, this, this boy had a very tough childhood. He comes from a difficult neighborhood. His, his single parent family, his mom, you know... Uh, has been working 18 hours a day, he has no parental supervision, and please go lenient, show him some leniency because he's, you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a fair chance in society. He didn't get a fair shake, so go easy on him. Right? So the law will apply easier on this kid because he had a tough circumstance. Right? On the opposite end of the spectrum is somebody who comes from a very wealthy background and stole a Kit Kat because it was fun for the thrills. Right? But he's the governor's kid. So now you should go easy on him because it looks bad for the public. It's bad morale. It's bad press. And the judge is like, I don't know if we should do this to him. So the law can bend because the judge is lenient in one favor or lenient in the other favor. And the law is kind of flexible. It bends sometimes in the favor of the wealthy, sometimes in the favor of the poor. It can happen, you know. And the, both of those extremes can exist in society and both of them are talked about, one in Surah An-Nisa, the other in Surah Al-Wa'idah. So that both of those, those, those inclinations that can take away from justice have been removed. But now in this ayah, it, it, law is law, especially when it comes to human life. And this is very powerful because in other matters of law, there's leniency. But when it comes to human life, Allah did not give leniency. When it comes to human life. Al-hurru bil hur wal-abdu bil-abd wal-untha bil-untha. فَمَنْ عُفِيَ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ شَيْءٌ يعني عُفِيَ شَيْءٌ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ When something has been forbidden for the, this person's case by his brother. Such amazing language. It's so amazing. Allah is talking about the guy who's standing trial, who's supposed to be killed. Because he committed murder. And Allah says his brother, his brother pardoned something from him. You know who his brother is? Let me tell you who his brother is. So this guy, A, killed B. And B has family, yes? And the family is sitting in trial. And the family that's sitting in trial says, you know, we want to forgive A. We don't want him to get the death penalty, we want to forgive him. Those family, they're not his family, they're the family of the victim. They're not the family of the killer. But in the Quran, Allah calls the one who let him go, Akhihi. Akhihi, his brother. This is his brother. Subhanallah. You know, Allah, first of all, describing the unity of the ummah, even in case of murder, he's killed your family member, he's still your brother in Islam. Iman is stronger than blood. Just in the word akhi. And he couldn't forgive him entirely, he pardoned somewhat. In other words, there are three options. Three options. What are those three options? You can either demand eye for an eye, life for a life. The second, you can demand, you know, uh, you can forgive altogether. Like, لا شيء يعني تماما. He just completely forgave the person. We don't want anything. The third could be, you, what you could call in modern language, I'm suing this person. I'm, I'm taking a lawsuit. I want damages. You killed the provider in our family. You killed the breadwinner in our family. You killed our son who was taking care of us. Now there's a loss in the family. We don't know how to get that taken care of. You're going to pay those damages. You're going to make up for what you've done. So those are the three kinds of options. But who's been given those options? His brother. Meaning, the, the fellow Muslim, who's the mazloom, right? The family of the mazloom. Bil ma'roof. Now, fattiba'un bil ma'roof, then that should be followed in a way that everybody recognizes. In other words, the entire society should recognize that these people have a right to demand whatever damages they have the right to demand. Wa ada'un ilayhi bi ihsan, and those damages should be paid with ihsan. Who's going to pay those damages? The murderer. Now look at the, again, the incredible language of the Qur'an. On the one hand, there is law. I hope I get to explain this properly. On the one hand, there is law. And on the other hand, there is reform. When somebody gets a jail sentence, that's the law. They're going to go to jail. But that person who goes to jail is a human being. And if they go to jail, their character deteriorates. They're around criminals for years. And they come back and there's a revolving door. They get back into crime when they come back again. 
So there's, there's the, you implemented the law, but there is no room for these people who committed a crime to get better, to become better people. Allah is expecting people who have committed murder, ada'un ilayhi bi ihsan, pay it back to the family, to his brother, and pay it back with excellence, bi ihsan. Now how are you going to pay something back? You're going to earn. How are you going to earn? You're going to earn halal, because you have to pay it with what? Ihsan. You're going to do the best kind of work. You're going to earn an honest living. You're going to become a transformed human being in society. Because this family gave you a chance, you're going to take that chance, you're going to run with it with Ihsan. You're going to be a model citizen thereafter. The, the transformation and the reform of a criminal, of a murderer, is embedded inside the ayah, just inside one ayah. An entire sociology of the Qur'an inside just a few words. وَأَدَاءٌ إِلَيْهِ بِإِحْسَانٍ He says, ذَلِكَ تَخْفِيفٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ That is lightening the burden from you, from your, from your Rabb. Allah has lightened for you. He's made things, instead of making them heavier, He's made things lighter for you. In other words, this person who is going to pay back, Allah Azza wa Jal is not making him criminalized for the rest of his life. If the victim's family has forgiven him, society has forgiven him. He doesn't wear that label the rest of his life. You know how we have in our justice system, you have a criminal background? Like if you've done time in jail or something like that, and you can't get a job the rest of your life, and you can't get, go into a certain school, and they'll look at your background, and you're done for it. I mean, your, your past mistake will ruin your entire future. What does the Qur'an do? Allah says, if I've forgiven you, and if the people who have wronged you have forgiven you, then society should forgive you. You should be able to move, move on with your life. You've changed. Human beings are not always evil. Even the one who may have committed what? Murder. فَاتِّبَاعٌ بِالْمَعْرُفُ وَأَدَاءٌ إِلَيْهِ بِإِحْسَانٍ ذَلِكَ تَخْفِيفٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ That is a thing, that is a way to make light in society, to make, uh, to lessen in society for, from your Rabb. Now think about this. If you don't open that door, if you have criminals who are now forever until they die labeled as criminals, they have no path to reform, then you know what? If everybody tells me I'm a criminal, eventually I'm going to accept Yes, that's what I am. And uh, then that's what you are, is that what, that's what you do, then the next crime becomes not harder, it becomes easier and easier and easier. Does crime spread in society or go down? Everybody suffers because this, this prohibition isn't there. ذَلِكَ تَخْفِيفٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَرَحْمًا فَمَنْ اِعْتَدَى بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَلَهُ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمًا There can be criminals who violate, even you give them a chance and they do other crimes. Then for the one who violates this after, then forget you know, retribution, forget qisas, forget the forgiveness option from the family, then he gets painful punishment. فَلَهُ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ In other words, there's no room for this kind of person. You know, repeated criminals, repeat offenders, then there's no room for the justice system to be lenient against them. Then you give them the toughest possible punishment, use the full extent of the law. So the Qur'an's picture of Islamic law, the law, the, the hudud, is actually one in which people should be given a chance at first, and let them come back into society, make their way back into society. And if they, can, if they keep repeating the offense, and they get caught, then you know what? Then the full extent of the law. But you know, our picture of Islamic law is, as soon as somebody makes a mistake, come here, let me chop his hand. Like we want to implement the full extent of the law the first chance we get. That's what we want to do. That is not the language of the Qur'an. That is not the implementation of Sharia. The implementation of Sharia is giving ch people chances in the beginning. If they made a mistake, give them a chance. Even in something so extreme, it's an opportunity to bring that up, so I'll bring it up. It's even in something so extreme like zina. Zina is one of the worst crimes in Islam. It's put next to murder. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسِ لَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ قَتَلْ زِنَا قَتَلْ زِنَا They're next to each other in the Qur'an. A serious, serious crime. And yet Allah made a distinction between the married one who's committed zina and the unmarried one who's committed zina. And the unmarried one who's committed zina, there's the, there's the whipping, the lashing. And even then when you have four witnesses, even then when you have four witnesses, and by the way, even after that, that's not the first thing that came down by the way. The first thing that came down was in Surah An-Nisa. If, if they did commit the crime, فَاسْتَشْهِدُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةً مِّنْكُمْ if, four, if you can seek four witnesses against them, فَإِنْ شَهِدُوا And if they did testify that these two people have unmarried have committed zina, then what should you do? فَأَمْسِكُهُنَّ فِي الْبُيُوتِ Then keep those women inside the home. وَالَّذَانِ يَأْتِيَانِهَا مِنْكُمْ فَآذُوهُمَا If two Muslim, Muslim boy and girl have done it, then آذُوهُمَا Cause them pain. The language of the ayah. Cause them pain. You know what that means? Cause them pain? Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala al-izdijar, yell at them. How could you do this? You should be ashamed of yourself. And everybody's yelling at them. 
And when you're done yelling at them, janido, let them go. That was the early law in the Quran for zina. Because they're young and stupid and they made a big mistake. It's a big mistake, but you don't kill them. And you don't even rip them yet. Because society wasn't ready for that yet. But if you're so shameless and you're so reckless that you can do something as ugly as zina in public with four people watching, then you should get whipped. Then, you sh then there should be punishment. That's serious business. And even then that whipping, that's another, that's Surah An-Nur, I won't go there, we're talking about murder right now. But I'm trying to tell you a principle in Sharia. Allah gives room in the beginning. Allah gives room. When the ayah said, فَآذُوهُمَا in the ayat of zina, in the early ayat of zina in Surah An-Nisa, some of the Sahaba said, you know what we should do? We should make them lie down, and we should take a stick, and we should hit the bottom of their feet. Some said ten times, some said five times. Five is enough. Then let them go. Now don't do that again. Subhanallah. Because they didn't know what, how Allah left it open. And some just said, just yell at them and that should be okay. A couple said, slap them and, you know, that should be fine. Subhanallah. Like the, the conversations among the Sahaba about those ayat are amazing to read. Just amazing. And that's the law of Islam. But today, when someone says, I want to implement Sharia, they should have a chainsaw in their hand ready. Because <laughs> they're just, you know, that this is what implementation of Sharia means. Allah says, الْحُرُّ بِالْحُرُّ وَالْعَبْدُ بِالْعَبْدُ وَالْأُنْثَى بِالْأُنْثَى فَمَنْ عُفِيَ لَهُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ شَيْءٌ فَاتِّبَاعٌ إِلَيْهِ بِمَعْرُوفٌ فَاتِّبَاعٌ بِالْمَعْرُوفٌ وَأَدَاءٌ إِلَيْهِ بِإِحْسَانٌ ذَلِكَ تَخْفِيفٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ فَمَنْ اِعْتَدَى بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَلَهُ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Last thing about this ayah that I want to share with you. Very important. In, the, in modern justice system, we have something called a jury. A jury is an independent group of people that are not supposed to be privy to the case and they kind of make a call, make a calling on the case we found the defendant guilty, not guilty, etc. right? or there's a hung jury but at the end of it all the sentence the se what should be the punishment where does it come from, do you know? the punishment comes from the judge and sometimes the judge says I want to give you a life sentence sometimes the judge says I want to give you the death penalty sometimes the judge says I want to pardon you sometimes the judge says there should be some kind of uh, you know, uh, negotiation, like a, you know, there's a guy from the mafia got caught, he killed like 10 people, he says, but I can give you names, I'll get you names, I'll get you everybody, so just give me a protective custody and this and that, and he can cut a deal, now he's not going to get the death penalty, because he's got other people, other criminals he got caught, you understand? So there are, there's room, flexible room inside the justice system, not everybody gets the same punishment, it doesn't happen. And when he cuts a deal, or because he has a great lawyer, he, he gets off after 10 years, or whatever it is. You know who suffers? I don't suffer when I'm watching this on the news. I'm not directly anyway. The jury doesn't suffer. But in the court, there's a family sitting there. Family of who? The victim. They're sitting there crying. What kind of justice is this? How does he kill my son and then walk away after 10 years? How come nobody asks what I think? How can this be fair? How come they said he's, uh, they found him you know, uh, guilty but they're going to let him go after six months? Or after probation or whatever else. The family sitting there crying. Now don't tell them it's Sharia law. Because Sharia law is barbaric. These animals. Just go to that family and say, you know, imagine if there was an amendment in the constitution that said that once guilt has been proven, once we know that this person has committed murder and it's proven, that the justice system the judge came to the family, the victim's family, and said, if you like, you have three options. You may sue the murderer, you may forgive the murderer, or you may ask for the death penalty. But we'll give you the option. We'll give you the option. Don't tell them it's Islam. Just tell them that those are your options. Or you can let the judge decide. And let the, you know, the public defendant decide, or whatever. Let them make their deals. What would any family pick? Any family on the face of this earth. May Allah not put us in that situation. But if a, situa if a family is in that situation, what would they, wouldn't they want to have a say in what should happen? Wouldn't they want to have a say? And many would want to forgive. There are people who attend the execution of the murderer and say, I forgive you. I mean, the system hasn't forgiven you, but I forgive him. I feel bad for him. If it were up to me, I'd let him go. They should be given that choice. They should be given that choice. It's actually very natural. The deen actually appeals to human nature. It appeals to human nature. It's very powerful. The only thing that's, you know, bad marketing for the deen is now the most beautiful word. Sharia, Islam, Islamic law. 
you know, hudud. These terms, people hear them and they shiver and they get scared. Don't tell them it's sharia. Don't tell them it's Islamic law. Just tell them what the rule is and they'll be like, yeah, that makes sense. Man, why don't we have that? Yeah, why, why don't we? Because this is, Allah sent this to people, He knows who He created. Allah يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقْ As in, He knows who He created. He knows the nature of the human being. May Allah Azza wa give us an appreciation of His perfect ahkam. And may Allah Azza wa make, you know, all societies in the world, societies of qisas, so people can actually have justice. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Now, inshallah.